morning. It's Sunday, January 31st, and it's time for us to worship together. Let's go. Good morning. This is Pastor Eric. I am the lead pastor at Hillside Assembly in Ripon, Wisconsin. I want to welcome you to our worship experience today. Uh, Unfortunately, weather did not cooperate with us this weekend, so we weren't able to drive in church. But I want to let you know that's okay, because God uses all circumstances and situations for His glory. And I believe that today we're going to connect with someone that had had regular things planned out, we wouldn't be able to reach that individual today. So if you're here connecting with us and you need hope, you need need some joy in your life, you need some encouragement, you are in the right place. And we're glad that you're with us today. If it's your first time connecting with us, you can find out more about our church at hillsideassembly.org. You can also contact us from there. Hey, we'd love for you to be able to give and contribute to the ministry here at Hillside, and you can do that online at hillsideassembly.org. You can just click the link and give there. Hey, we're excited about what will be happening next Sunday. And to do that, uh, I brought in a special friend to talk about Super Bowl Sunday and what we'll be doing for the worship experience here at Hillside. It's Jive Time with Jeb! Well, hi! This is Jeb. Thanks for joining us. I'm here with my good friend, Adrian Granados, and uh, we're very excited about something coming up here this weekend. Uh, Adrian, do you know what is special about Sunday, February 7th? Yeah, it's going to be the Super Bowl. Super Bowl Sunday. That is right. And you know what? If we're going to have a Super Bowl Sunday, I think it needs to start with a supersized worship experience right here at Hillside. And so we've got some special guests lined up. Adrian, why don't you tell them about who our special guests are this Sunday? Yeah, we're going to have our missionaries from Ripon College, Luke Hatfield and Mandy Kimes, join us. Woo! That's right. I love both of those guys. They are awesome missionaries and ministry partners sharing Jesus with all sorts of people. So they're going to be here. We've got some other special guests that will make an appearance. I'm going to be there for Super Bowl Sunday worship experience. Adrian, are you going to be there? I will definitely be there. Woo, we got some things to celebrate. So be there Sunday. At what time? 11 a.m. 11 a.m. We'll see you then. Bye. No matter what comes to my life The cares you give The thoughts you think Is not all wasted time Seek and you will find Joy still comes in the morning Still walks with the hurting, just still alive and breathing. There's no more. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your eyes and keep singing. There's no more. The years go by. Lost our way from home. My father finds the child inside. He left for throwing away. Away 
the way it can wake my soul. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. Ghost in the light and dreaming. Where's the road? Dancing and dreaming, and still good news worth the needing. So lift your head and keep singing, praise the Lord. Let everything, let everything, let everything praise the Lord. Let everything, let everything, let everything praise the Lord. In the working, in the waiting. Let it praise the Lord in the blessing, in the breaking. Let it praise the Lord in the dying, the rising. Let it praise the Lord. Well, hey, I hope you enjoyed that time of worship. We'll have more of that at the end of our worship experience today. But we want to get into God's word today because God wants to speak to you. He wants to encourage you today. And so we're going to jump into our message series. We're doing a series called Just Like Jesus. And today's message is entitled, Don't Miss the Point. Boy, isn't that the truth? We don't want to miss the point of what God is trying to do in our life and through our lives today. It's so easy to get distracted, discouraged by the things that go, around, around, uh, that go on around us. But boy, if we can focus in on what God is speaking to us, if we can apply it to our life, man, it really makes a huge difference. And we don't want to miss the miracles God wants to do in your life and then through your life as you impact the lives around you. And so we're going to be jumping into Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 21 uh, this morning. Uh, as we get into this, you might think this sounds really familiar because we're going to look at the first part of the scripture. We look at a miracle. And I don't know, during this whole season, if you're a TV watcher, yeah, you probably noticed that a lot of your television programs last year and into the summer uh, weren't, weren't new. They were reruns. And this miracle looks a little bit like a rerun. But I want to assure you that it's not, that Jesus is trying to make a very large statement in the passage we're about to read about our spiritual lives and our development in our relationship with him. So let's jump into it. Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 1. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people because Jesus always has compassion for people. Let's make sure we're compassionate for people as well. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken seven loaves, and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well. They gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. 
after he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmutha. Now, people often confuse this miracle with the feeding of the 5,000, which happens a few chapters before this in the book of Mark. It's recorded in all four Gospels, yet this miracle is only recorded in Matthew and Mark. But it's not difficult to distinguish between this miracle and the other feeding of the multitudes. First, miracles took place in Galilee. The first miracle took place in Galilee, near Bethsaida, uh, and involved primarily Jewish people. This miracle took place near Decapolis and involved mostly Gentiles. In the first miracle, Jesus started with five loaves and two fish, while here he had seven loaves and a few fish. The 5,000 had been with him for just one day, but here 4,000 people had been with him for three days. Twelve baskets of fragments were left over after the 5,000 were fed, but only seven baskets after the 4,000 were fed. And once again, we see and are encouraged by our Lord's compassion for people, his complete control over situations and circumstances. So when you look at this, um, this, this kind of shows some of the similar things, especially to the disciples and lessons that we can learn from this passage. Jesus shows his disciples how to work a problem. He says, now look, don't look at what you don't have. Take an inventory of what you do have. God always wants us to look and be grateful for what we do have. When we take what we have and we place it in God's hands, God can do more than enough. Jesus takes what looks like is insignificant, just some fish and bread, not nearly enough to feed these 4,000 people. But in his hands, it becomes more than enough. And in fact, there's leftovers. How cool is Jesus? He used this. Uh, he uses the disciples to distribute the blessing. And God wants you and I to be part of that process. We're disciples of Christ today. And what God places in our hands, what we give back to him, what he blesses, and then he asks us to distribute what we have been given to our community, to our workplaces, to our campus, our neighborhoods. God is wanting us to be the distributors of his good gifts. And whatever God has placed in you is something that God wants to multiply and have you move and be a blessing to others with. Um, Jesus is also trying to show a progression here of personal growth in our relationship with him. A progression in your miracle, if you would think about it that way. Jesus is illustrating for us the importance that he wants to expand the kingdom of God to every person. The kingdom of God is not for you and I to hold on to, to hoard. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched one of those shows where, where people are hoarders and they have all this stuff in their house and it's 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 horrible. Um, I know I worked with someone that was a hoarder one time, and, and it was by far one of the most challenging things that I ever uh, did in the in an area of serving. Uh, it was so complicated. It was so heartbreaking, uh, and and it was some of the stuff was good stuff, but it had become junk because it had been not kept up. It had not been properly taken care of. And see, when we are are, are hoarders of the gospel. When we say it's for us and we put ourselves at the center of the story, we miss out on the greatest blessing of all. The gospel's for every person. No matter your color, no matter your race, your nationality, uh, your social or economic background, no matter what your past is, no matter what your present currently is, I want you to know that the gospel is for you. God wants to bless you with the power of the gospel his salvation power to come into a relationship with him that he can break the sin in your life and he can help you move forward in so many ways. The miracle of Jesus' salvation is is the place, the grace starts with us. It starts with you. The miracle starts, the, the miracle of salvation starts with you. But let me tell you, it doesn't end with you. See, first, Jesus does something in you. He brings you into the kingdom. He begins to work in your life. But we're not meant to to sit around and wait for us to get perfect, to go and and start being servants in his kingdom. In fact, once salvation starts, we are meant to instantaneously, right after that, begin to serve his kingdom, begin to serve Jesus, begin to serve others. That's so important. So God wants to do something in you first and then do something through you. 
Uh, if, if you're stuck where you're the center of your story, if you're just, if everything revolves around you, then your spiritual growth stops. It stagnates. And I don't know about you, but I've, I'm, I like to fish once in a while. And when you go to water that's stagnant, it's horrible. All sorts of gunk starts to grow. It smells. You definitely don't want to drink the water. And most of the time, you don't want to eat anything out of that water because it's, it's nasty. Now imagine that spiritually, if that's what's going on inside of you. If your heart is all revolved around you and your needs, your wants, your desires, if you're the center of your story, that your heart's going to get stagnant and all that junk is going to start growing there. And that is not what God wants to do. Because stagnant water becomes gross. It becomes toxic. And I want to tell you this. Jesus does not want toxic disciples. We don't want toxic Christians. We want contagious Christians. Christians that are following Jesus, excited about what God is doing. And wanting to share that with our community. Let's look at the next passage of scripture. As we talk about toxicity uh, in, the, in the relationship of, of people following Christ, I think we're about to see some real toxic behavior in this next portion of scripture. Verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, go back and got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. Point two of our message this morning is missing the miracle. And that's exactly what happened here with these Pharisees. Jesus just did a supersized miracle. He fed 4,000 people and he didn't feed them just physically. He fed them spiritually. It's a dual-sided miracle. It's amazing. It's pretty incredible. In fact, we can use the word miraculous. He fed 4,000 people with basically a happy meal. It's incredible. But this group of highly educated religious scholars, they spent their entire life uh, dedicated to understanding God's word. And yet, they can't see what's happening right in front of them. They're not celebrating this momentous miracle, this incredible thing that happened, the lives that were touched and changed, the, the, the absolute uh, fascination of, of, of molecular duplication that happened within these baskets with fish and bread. They're, they're not celebrating that. They're not even discussing it among themselves and what this means and the ramification. And the reason they're not is because they're blind. These people are blind to what Jesus has done. They're blind to what he's doing. And they're blind to what he's going to do. Why didn't they care about this miracle Jesus just did? Well, the truth is, is that the miracle didn't revolve around them. They weren't the center of the story. And they didn't care about these people. Remember that what Jesus said in the scripture that we read earlier this morning that Jesus' heart was moved with compassion for these people. Yet here, we see these people who are religious, we see these people that are, are supposed to be studying God's word, yet they have no compassion. In fact, they don't care anything about these people. They're Gentiles. They, they think that these people are underneath them, not worthy of God or, or, or the gifts that the Jews have. Wow, what a shame. Are you missing the miracles God is doing because you're not in the center of them? That's a deep question. Take a moment to think about that. You may want to just answer that really quickly out of hand, but I think it's worth taking the time for us to dig a little deeper into our hearts and minds. Am I missing the miracles that God is doing because I'm not at the center of them? Wow. If that's the case, I think it's time to do some hard work. Have you become like the, the blind Pharisees? Do you only care about Jesus doing things that are important to you? Do you only care when you're the one that's at the center of the story? Let's get some heart work done. The, the, when, you, when you think about it, I mean, the Pharisees were asking for a sign and miracle, which is interesting. Jesus just did one. Yet they don't, they're oblivious to it. They're blind to it. And, and they're asking for a sign. They're asking for a miracle. But yet there's not a need. There's no one that's sick. 
There's no one that's hurt or paralyzed. There's no one that's hungry. This is, I just want you to entertain me, Jesus. I just want you to prove to me that, God, you can do things when I, when I snap my fingers and say it. And that's why we see this side from Jesus, because he's frustrated. He's like, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not a dancing monkey that, that performs for you when you snap your fingers. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Our God is greater than that. Our God does not, does not come at our, at our call, our beck and need. We don't rule over our God. Our God rules over us. We've got to make sure we've got things in the right order. If our heart, if your heart is matching more like the Pharisees, than the heart of Jesus, then it's time for a change. And I want to tell you, I don't want you to miss your miracle because you're so caught up with you being the center of the story. See, the greatest miracles happen when we step into what's important to Jesus. We, we got to get into the flow of where God is going. And I can tell you 100% for sure, God is going to our community. Jesus wants to reach the people who do not know him, the people that are hurt, the people that are broken. Yes, God wants to do something great in your life. And I know this morning there are people watching that have a relationship with Jesus and you're in need of miracles. But I want to tell you, I, I, I see it in scripture and I've seen it in my own life and I've seen it in the lives I'm surrounded with. When you prioritize, when you push through and you, you, you make the mission that Christ has for us the number one thing, that yes, we're going to give, we're going we're gonna to serve, we're going to do our best to reach our neighbors, our people at our workplace that we work with, our people at our campus that we do, we do school with. I will tell you this, miracles begin to flow in your own life that you may have not even taken the time to even ask God for. He shows up and he brings his blessing when we walk in his ways. And God's way is to take the gospel message to the people who need it in our community. Let's get to point three today, and that's this, oblivious and confused, because I don't think Jesus' frustration ends here. He just had this amazing time with 4,000 people who got fed. They, they, it was a blessing. It was three days of hanging out with Jesus. This is awesome. And these are people that, that were far away from God, yet here they are rejoicing with him. Now he's got this encounter with the Pharisees. They don't even see the miracles that Jesus is doing. But now we're going to see the response of the disciples, starting in verse 14. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread. Now, first of all, the, Jesus just supersized this amazing meal. They're like, oh man, we forgot to bring bread on the trip. Where, where were the leftovers at? But they forgot to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. And then Jesus takes this moment to try to teach them, encourage them, and, and warn them, right? And anytime Jesus brings a warning, correction into our life, he's always trying to do so in a way that brings hope as well. Jesus warned them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Then the disciples have this conversation, verse 16. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. <sighs> Hold on, I'll come back to this because it's all crazy. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And then I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000. How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Jesus must have been frustrated. He's trying to teach the disciples his valuable lessons. Look, don't let your heart be like the heart of the Pharisees, where you're blinded to the things that I'm trying to do, or where you're so caught up and you're the center of the story that you miss out. And, and when, when Jesus is trying to say that and, and, and the disciples are discussing this and they come to this conclusion that it's all about this loaf of bread, Right, Because verse 16 said, they discussed this one with another and said, it's because we have no bread. The disciples lacked the vision Jesus was trying to show them. And the disciples' minds were stuck on the physical bread in their possession. 
Uh, all we have is a loaf. We, we didn't bring the bread. We didn't bring the leftovers. They're, they're, they're looking at themselves and looking at their own physical need and, and what they have. And they're stuck on this, the physical possession of the bread, not realizing that the bread of life is on the boat. They're missing it. They're, they're, they're confused. They're oblivious to what's happening. They're stuck looking at what was instead of what's possible. They're stuck in the moment when Jesus is casting vision for the future. See, Jesus is the resource. Jesus is an empower. When someone was on a mat, when they were disabled in the, in, the, in the New Testament, and Jesus came along, what did he do? He didn't leave them there. He called them to get up and stand. He, he let, reached out a hand and, and helped them to their feet. It's, it's this place that God's calling you this morning. If you're down on the mat, Jesus is calling you to get up, to empower you. He's speaking vision into your life, to the future of what he can do in and through your life. You're not always going to be right where you're at today. When faced with the impossible, Jesus makes a way. When you've got one loaf of bread, I want to tell you, Jesus can feed a dozen disciples. The disciples are stuck on this whole thing of this loaf of bread, and how are they going to eat? They just saw Jesus do a miracle. For the second time, Jesus takes a happy meal and feeds thousands of people. We've got a loaf of bread. Look, Jesus can make it enough. Jesus can take whatever you've got and make it enough. As we come to our conclusion today of our message, let's go back to the beginning of our scripture. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He reached out, the first miracle he did, he reached out to primarily Jewish people. And now he's, he's showing that, that this, this miracle is not only just for the Jewish people, it's for all people. This is a big, huge thing. This is a mindset that's blowing, blowing down walls. And Jesus has been slowly doing this the last few chapters. He's taking the gospel message outside of the Jewish culture, which in itself is, is, is for the Jewish culture messed up. They're, it's blowing minds, right? And so he does this. He does miracles. He provides a message. He provides salvation for all the people. And that's the mission. For all people, that all people might know, that none may perish. All might have the ability to be saved by hearing the gospel message. Not only did the disciples not get this here in this passage we just read, but jump to the future. Acts chapter 2. Jesus at this point has, has been crucified. He's, he's, he's dead. He has been resurrected. They've come back. The church is being established. The disciples are waiting to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, that happens. People start getting saved. But for 10 years, the gospel message is confined to just Jewish people. They don't go beyond, beyond their own people. They keep the message to themselves. It's not till 10 years later, in Acts chapter 10 and in Acts chapter 11, that through the nudging of the Holy Spirit and through God's divine hand, that he pushes the disciples to go get on it. What I showed you over 10 years ago, take the gospel message to the people who need it. It's got to go beyond the walls of the Jewish culture. And for us, the message is the gospel must go beyond the walls of the church. As the church we got to get this message. And here in Acts chapter 10, when the church starts to do that, when they go, this is what God's doing. The grace of God has expanded beyond our cultural boundaries. And now it's, it's flowing into the lives of these Gentiles. The gospel message is for everybody. And when they started to prioritize that, guess what happened? More miracles began to happen. More resources became available to the church. A great move of God swept across the known world. So what, what does that mean for us today? Well, I don't want to take the next 10 years to get there. I think this is the hour, this is the season for it to happen for us. It's time for us to get this now and to get into the flow of God. I believe that you have not experienced the fullness of what God has for you until you give Jesus away. If you want to see greater miracles, if you want to see greater resource, if you want to see a greater move of God, Commit to, to learning what the disciples failed to learn. That it's not about a loaf of bread in your hand. It's about taking the bread of life to our community, to our workplaces, 
our neighborhoods and campuses. Well, I think it's time that we go to prayer this morning. You know, God wants to reach out and touch your life, change your life. Like we said earlier in our message, it's the fact that God wants to do something in you and then do something through you. But that journey has to have a beginning. And if you're watching this morning and you need a relationship with Jesus, I want to be able to pray with you to begin that relationship. First, it's admitting that we're a sinner, we're not perfect, that, that we're broken. And listen, we're all broken. But Jesus came, he died, and he rose again because he wants a relationship with you and because he can make you whole. He can change this thing inside your heart, inside your spirit that, that you're missing. He can set you free from your past or your present. He can give you direction for your future. So let's pray this morning for that. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I'm hurt. I'm lost. God, I need you in my life. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you came, that you died, and that you rose again. But Lord, you're calling me into a relationship with you, and I want to be changed by you. Lord, help me to begin to follow you, to get connected and plugged in to your kingdom. Lord, to realize that I don't have to do life alone, but that I can have a family, brothers and sisters in you, that can help encourage me, Help me to find the truth. Lord, you can help me, steer me in the ways of serving in your kingdom. Lord, we thank you today for your salvation grace. Lord, we pray this morning, God, for the word that was preached. Lord, we don't want to have the heart of the Pharisees. We don't want to miss what you've done, what you're doing, and what you want to do. Lord, we don't want to, to get caught up where we're the center of the story and we only care about things that you're doing if we're at the middle of it. Lord, we pray this morning, God, that we don't, we don't want to be like the disciples. We don't want to have to wait 10 more years to get it. But Lord, we want to step into the flow of resource and miracles today because God, we want to step into our community, taking the gospel beyond the walls of our church, beyond our, our, our just culture here in church culture to the community that desperately needs you and not just for Ripon but our surrounding communities as well for Omro and Berlin and Green Lake and Princeton all these other communities that Lord are represented as a part of our church family you've called us to share and to spread the gospel message of hope Jesus thank you for entrusting us with this and Lord help us Lord, to have the same passion that you had when you fed these 4,000 people. Help us to have compassion and to care about the people in our community, even the ones that don't look like us, even the ones that think differently than we do. Uh, Lord, we are brought together by this. We are all the same at the foot of the cross. And Lord, you are awesome. And God, with your help, I know that we can, we can help several, not dozens and hundreds of people come into a relationship with you. Lord, help us to be able to do that. Give us the vision for where you're wanting to take this church. And Lord, give us the creativity to reach our communities in brand new ways. We give you praise, glory, and honor. God's people said, amen. Hey, we're going to go to a worship song. I'm going to come back and I'm going to lead you in communion. Walking slave to 
sin, I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. So take me to the riverside. Take me under baptized. I need you. Oh, God, I need you. Oh, forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever makes me want to change your forgiveness it's like sweet sweet honey on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears like holy water on my Welcome back. Before we do one more song uh, for uh, to end our service with worship, uh, let's get ready to take communion this morning. First of all, let's just ask the Lord to forgive us for, for any of the things that we've just not been doing right. Uh, maybe we had the wrong attitude. Maybe we've been worrying about things. Maybe, maybe we were mean to somebody this morning. If you're watching at home and maybe it was your spouse or your kids or maybe it was your parents that you said something you know, it just wasn't right. You didn't treat them right or whatever. Would you just take a moment? Would you turn to them and say that you're sorry and that you want to make that right today? Lord, we come before you, God, with, with hearts surrendered. Lord, where we have not been walking in the ways that you've asked us to, where we've struggled, maybe where we've fallen down, where we failed you this week, Lord, we just say that we're sorry. We turn from our sin. We turn from those things that are holding us back. And Lord, we're in the fight. We're up. We want to get up off the mat. And God, we want to make a difference in your kingdom. So Lord, help us to have the right heart now as we enter into communion. Now, there's nothing magic about communion. You're going to take a piece of bread, some type of starch that symbolizes the, uh, the body of Christ. So we're going to start there. And then we've got uh, grape juice or Really, to be honest with you, any type of fluid you can drink will work for this because it's not about it's not about these elements. It's about our heart, communing with God and making things right with God and remembering what He did for us. So, uh, the wafer or bread that you have in your hand represents Christ's body, and He actually led His disciples in this. And uh, I'm going to read from Luke uh, chapter 22, uh, verse 19. And He took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it. And gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me jesus we remember your body that lord you came you you came you you didn't stand at a distance but you engaged with us you came and walked among us you put on a skin suit and walked this earth and lord we thank you for your body for your sacrifice for what you were willing to do for what you endured for for the times where you were frustrated with people when you were doing ministry, we thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you were willing to endure the cross, that your body was broken, God, for us. But Lord, you endured it all. And Lord, I know, I know that that symbolizes, God, that we can endure when you are in the center of our life. And Lord, we want to make you the center of our life today. And from now on, Lord, we thank you for this this piece of bread that we're about to take together, and we remember all that you've done for us. 
Let's take the bread together. Now the scripture goes on to read, and likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Hey look, because Jesus is sacrifice, we can be right with God. We don't have to, uh, we don't have to go and, and make sacrifices of animals and stuff in a temple anymore because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. His blood was poured out for you and I. And because it was, the, 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 the mistakes we make, the sin in our life is covered by that. And so we can have a relationship with Jesus because before this, you had to go through these sacrifices to even communicate with God. Man, we don't have to do that anymore because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Let's get ready to take uh, the cup together this morning. Lord, we thank you for your blood poured out for us. Lord, you didn't even hesitate. You didn't think twice about it. You said, I love these people and I'm willing to give my life for them. Lord, you took our place. And Lord, we're so grateful for that. And Lord, not only that, are we grateful that you poured out your blood, but that God, your power was on display because you rose from the grave three days later. That resurrection power is available to us. No matter what our bodies feel like, no matter what things we might go through, no matter what challenges we face, both individually and together as a corporate body, that God, you demonstrate your resurrection power and that resurrection power is available to your children. Lord, we pray for your resurrection power to be alive and well within us. Lord, may we experience it on a daily basis. We thank you for your blood that was poured out. We take the cup together. Church, I have had a great time with you today. I know it's not exactly uh, convenient. I know it's not exactly what we would want. But boy, let me tell you, God spoke to us today. We've engaged in worship. We've had communion. We're going to go back into worship for one final song today. And I hope you'll give it your all today. Look, I want to encourage you. Would you pick up the phone and, and make a text message? Call somebody today. Be an encourager. Be compassionate. And let's remember, our mission is to reach people with the gospel, both in word, but also in our actions and our servant's heart towards the people that we live with in our communities. Uh, don't forget that you can give today. You can visit us on hillsideassembly.org to give, but also to connect with us. And we would love to hear from you about what's going on in your life, how we can pray for you. So contact us there. Church, we love you. We're going back into worship one last time. The highest king would welcome I was lost, but he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me the sun sets free Oh, his Not for 
Oh, 